I am thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with you, Mrs. Stanton. I have been a member of the League of Women Voters for 40 years. I know that the League was first formed by the suffragists in the National American Women Suffrage Association in 1920. And I do know that you were the very first president of that organization. It was created to help 20 million women carry out their new responsibilities as voters. And even after 100 years, rest assured that that is still the main mission of the League of Women Voters. So I thank you for being part of that. I have so many questions to ask you. May I begin? By all means. Many people are not aware that you were born in Johnstown and attended school at the Troy Female Seminary in Troy. It's now known as the Emma Willard School. What experiences from your youth growing up in this region helped shape your activism later in life? Well, really for me, it was all formed in my father's law office. All of the future that uh, would become uh, connected with my name and with my legacy came from that law office and and really from Daniel Katie himself both in my desire to to right the wrongs that I could see my father as as an attorney as as a justice could not write and also to to in some way find a way to prove to him um, that I was as worthy as my brother oh. The, uh, my experience in Johnstown was as the child of great privilege. And my, my father was the wealthiest man in our community. He was an enormously powerful and intelligent man, a charismatic man. Also very shy, a man of, of deep sentiment and deep conviction. And I wanted nothing more than to make him proud of me. Now, I also knew that all of his girls together did not compare to his son, Eliezer. And Eliezer was the only one of his male children who survived into adulthood. Oh. So when my brother graduated from college, came home, took ill, and died, my father was absolutely broken. And I still remember that moment when I went into that darkened parlor where my brother's casket lay and saw my father, a broken man, oh. sitting alone in the dark. I climbed up on his lap and I put my head against his chest and listened to his heartbeat. Mm. And I remember him putting his arms around me and saying, oh, my daughter, if only you were a boy. And it was at that moment that I decided that I would be everything that boys were supposed to be, that is clever and learned and brave. And as I continued to engage in mathematics, study of Latin, learning how to ride a horse, I began to realize that no matter what I accomplished, because I was a girl, I would never be seen as the same order of being as my brother would have been. And Healing was then compounded by watching as women came into my father's Johnstown law office, asking for his help, saying that they had no means of redress for their loss of property, their loss of freedom, their loss of custody. He could do nothing for them. So those two different influences from Johnstown stayed with me forever. Wow. And in up into the 1840s, you spent time in Albany as the New York State Legislature debated the Married Woman's Property Act of 1848. What was that experience like for you? What was the significance of that particular piece of legislation? Now, of course, in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, as had been true, at the founding of our nation, the ideals of property ownership were, were forefront. So the idea was that personhood, citizenship, was connected to our ability to, to manage our own affairs. 
the ability to own one's own property, to, to engage in contracts, meant that a person could defend himself. I had learned from my father that part of women's disability as, as legal beings was that we did not have the ability to control our own property after marriage. And as voting was often connected to our ability to do so, that meant that not just economically, but politically, socially, and educationally, we were at a supreme disadvantage. So my work uh, with the Married Women's Property Act um, alongside Ernestine Rose um, was an early education, not only in the kinds of legal disabilities that women face, but also in the social disabilities. There were very few men who were willing to entertain the idea that women were persons in our own right, that we had enough rational sense to even be worthy of, of having uh, property ownership, let alone the vote. Wow. And in 1848, you were the driving force behind the Women's Rights Convention that was held in Seneca Falls. How did that event come together? What were the important issues you felt needed to be addressed at that time? The Seneca Falls Convention in many ways began eight years earlier in London. I went with my husband on our honeymoon trip to London to the World Anti-Slavery Convention. And I was not a delegate, but I met a woman there who was, Lucretia Coffin Mott. Mm -hmm. Now Lucretia Coffin Mott was a, was a revelation of womanhood to me. Now poor Henry Stanton, on his honeymoon voyage finds that his wife has fallen deeply in love with Lucretia Coffin Mott, a, um, a radical woman. Now, Henry himself was a radical, but no one was as radical as Mrs. Mott was. And she took me under her wing as the men at that convention debated for days about whether or not women would be allowed to participate. And the men decided in their infinite wisdom that women would be allowed to stay in the building, but only if they were seated uh, in separately and not allowed to speak. Now, I will tell you that you can tell Lucretia Coffin Mott that she cannot speak in the convention, but you could not make her be quiet anywhere else in London. So I accompanied this woman as we went about that city, she giving speeches, often on religious liberty, political liberty. I had never encountered a woman with the amount of courage, uh, stalwart conviction that she had. And she changed me. She told me that I must take truth for my authority and never accept authority for my truth. And she told me I had as much right as John Calvin himself to speak my mind. So when I was in Seneca Falls, an overworked, overwrought mother of three little boys, soon to be seven children all together, uh, and the uh, glories and uh, interest of housekeeping had worn off at that point, I decided that um, I had to strike while the iron was hot. Lucretia Mott was in town. And when we went to this um, lovely gathering of women, uh, most of, of us were Quakers. I was the only non-Quaker present. And we were all discussing human rights. And I just poured out my discontent about the disabilities that women faced, um, legal and social, et cetera. Uh, and it was at that point that we began discussing various issues of human rights. And I poured out my discontent about my lot as an individual housekeeper, but also the lot of women in general. Now I had become aware, even more so than I had been in Johnstown of what women were facing, largely in part because of the um, Irish immigrant women who were my neighbors. And I could see that whatever I enjoyed, as Daniel Cady's daughter, as Henry Stanton's wife, was not theirs. What I enjoyed and thought was mine as a citizen was merely mine as a matter of privilege, a privilege that could be stripped from me at any time. It was a privilege that the Irish women, refugees from starvation and tyranny, could not enjoy and did not enjoy even in our free nation. 
So I poured out my discontent and we decided to have a convention. And we decided at our convention that we would, in utilizing the Declaration of Independence as a model, continue what our forefathers began. We wanted nothing less than perfect equality. We wanted, we wanted the right to custody of our own children, to control over our own persons, the ability to own property, whether or not we were married, to, to sign contracts, to serve on juries, to go to colleges and universities with our brothers. We wanted the right to vote. Now that one was more controversial. And even, even my dear mentor, Mrs. Mott said, Lizzie, thee will make us ridiculous. But I insisted upon it. I was not convinced, as were so many of the Quakers, the non-resistance, what today you might call pacifists, believed that to engage in political agitation was to engage in a slaveholding society, a coercive government. But I believed that if more abstained from political action, then only immoral people would engage in political action. I found a friend there in Frederick Douglass, a man I had known for many years, and I pulled him aside and told him that I intended to support suffrage in this convention, and I needed his support, and he gave it. And the two of us together were able to narrowly sway that group of people in Seneca Falls in 1848 to support suffrage. Wow, what a, it must have been so exciting to have Lucretia Mott right there with you, with great. But even though most believe that Susan B. Anthony attended the Seneca Falls Convention, you didn't actually meet her until three years later. But it began a friendship that lasted for about 50 years. How would you describe your relationship with Miss Anthony? She was a thorn in my side <laughs> and a light in my life mm -hmm. for all those decades. Now, with seven children, a group of little people that my husband often referred to as miserable little underdeveloped vandals, I needed as much help as I could get. And those children, I think, always feared that good, earnest woman walking down our walk and knocking on our door because they knew that at that point, their mother would be whisked away to do the work of the nation. And she would no longer be available for all of the games and uh, entertainments that I was usually engaged in with those boys and two daughters. Susan did not tolerate nonsense, not to the Stanton children, not in the United States. She <laughs> was not interested in doing anything that would dissuade um, the country from taking the right path. So she would hustle me off to some corner of the house that was a bit quieter. She would take charge of the babies, take charge of those boys, and um, she would uh, stir the puddings, as Henry said, so that I could write the speeches and then she could stir the nation. And that was the way we worked until the children were older. Um, and once that happened, then um, I began to travel as well. And the two of us tried to always maintain a united front. Mm -hmm. The problem was that she and I, as we grew older, we also grew disparate in our opinions. Oh. And uh, um, Focus was always on suffrage, uh, whereas mine drifted to other, um, other concerns. Um, I was much more concerned, for instance, with the cause of religious liberty uh, mm -hmm. and free thought, uh, much more concerned with issues related to women's uh, rights within their household, um, to self-sovereignty. And um, Susan would be very, um, well, she was driven to distraction sometimes. She would also be dis uh, disgusted with me for having baby after baby. And uh, she, would, uh, she would chide me for it. Um, I, I'm told that there was a letter she wrote to a friend that said that um, for um, 
one minute of pleasure, she said, to either Mr. Stanton or to herself, and she increases her cares considerably. But she would come to my house and um, she would, um, with the nation on her mind, and she would say, Mrs. Stanton, I need a speech. And I would say, Simpson, my whole heart is in this movement, but my hands belong to my family. And then she'd right. say, well then, I'll get a man to write the speech. Oh, that did it. And I would write the speech, but sometimes I would have to be firm and, and tell her that um, if she couldn't leave me alone, I would have another baby, and then where would she be? <laughs> well, it sounds like you had a very wonderful relationship. And speaking of friendships, you had a falling out with Frederick Douglass and other activists after the Civil War over the support of the 15th Amendment, which granted African-American men the right to vote. What were some of the considerations you made choosing not to support the amendment? What was the reaction to your decision among the suffragists? This was one of the darkest chapters mm -hmm. in my personal history and in the history of the women's movement. Now, what was happening at that time was that we had all in the American Equal Rights Association, those of us who had worked together at that point for decades, mm -hmm. decided that universal suffrage was the only path to pursue. At least that was the way I understood it. If we are to believe that rights are ours as a matter of human destiny, that we come into the world with them, and that pol politics and government are there merely to secure those rights, not to grant them, then how can we begin to offer a piecemeal liberty to the nation? I believe that the only path forward was to amend the Constitution in favor of universal suffrage. Mm -hmm. Anything short of that would put every single American citizen in danger. Wow. If there is a privilege, it can be rescinded. If it is a right and it is protected by all of us, then we are all protected together. Now, the Republicans who had been our allies for sometime, lukewarm allies, I will grant, decided that the way to protect black men's ability to vote, and I must say that they never fully or even slightly supported the idea of the women voting, was to link suffrage and citizenship to manhood. They appealed to the fathers of the country they said that as the loyal sons of the nation, they must protect the rights of men who had bled and died alongside white men in the Civil War. That black men had proved their manhood and therefore had the right to defend their homes, their wives, and their children, not only with bullets, but with ballots. Now this patriarchal definition of citizenship and personhood did not sit well with me. And I began to protest this idea that the black man should enter where women were not allowed, especially as we had been partners up until that point. Now the language became vitriolic, and I will admit, now that I am beyond the veil, that it was also injurious to the cause. But it is important also to recognize that those of us who were radicals in the 19th century and who used methods that you may not approve of were not operating in the vacuum of space. We did not come to these decisions based solely on um, our whim. We were operating within a political system that already existed that was led by men who were firmly entrenched in their own ideas and ideals. Mm -hmm. We had limited choices and I chose poorly. 
was a tough time for everybody. I do want to say something about Frederick Douglass, though, mm -hmm. because I think that he deserves better than he received. This is the man who stood up for me at great cost to himself for women's rights. This is also the man who I disappointed personally, politically. And this is also a man who found it in his heart to forgive me. I remember exactly what he said to me. At one point he said, Elizabeth, I will forgive you for being a woman if you will forgive me for being a Negro. And then he also said, and this was the last time I ever spoke to him. He said, do you suppose when we go to heaven that St. Peter will open the gates to us? And I said, I don't see why. There have been so many antis here on earth who have anti-suffrage, anti-civil rights, that I imagine they'll get to heaven before us and they will turn St. Peter against us too. And the gates of heaven will be closed to us as so many doors have been closed to us here on earth. And he looked at me and he said, well then, Mrs. Stanton, together arm in arm, you and I will go down below. <laughs> That's good. Well, in 1869, you and Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, mm -hmm. as we spoke of the strategy to secure women's suffrage through the federal amendment. The American Women's Suffrage Association was formed at the same time, but used a state-by-state -state strategy. Why did you feel a federal amendment method to secure the vote was better? And what were some of the strategies the organization used to achieve this goal? Well, as, as I said before, um, I, I believe firmly that our rights are ours um, as, as a matter, they are God-given. By birth, they are ours, uh, by virtue of our humanity. Uh, I, I find it very difficult to, to tolerate the idea that we have to go begging state by state. Uh, our, our federal government should protect all of our rights equally. Now, some of the, some of the methods we used, of course, Susan uh, challenged the, the um, prohibition of women of uh, voting by going and voting herself. Um, Virginia Minor did as well. Um, both of those cases did not end as we would have hoped. Um, Susan B. Anthony, um, her case went nowhere because of that, that judge's despicable decision, um, not even allowing her the chance to take it to a higher court. Uh, Virginia Minor went to the Supreme Court, and um, the Supreme Court justices, in their wisdom, decided that uh, there was no uh, reason for the government of the United States to protect the citizens' right to vote. They did not see it as a right, but as a privilege granted individually by the states. And that set us back quite a way. Uh, I, I chose to challenge uh, the idea of women's exclusion from politics by running for office in, in 1866, being the first woman to run for Congress. Um, of course, Victoria Woodhull, um, although she was not technically old enough to run for office, uh, did so. Um, uh, she, she had uh, Frederick Douglass as her running mate, much to his surprise and chagrin. And, um, and then, of course, Belva Lockwood legitimately ran for president in, 19, in 1884. Uh, again in 1888. So we, we attempted um, both performatively uh, and theoretically to, to challenge the idea that, that voting was a, a privilege granted by states um, and, and to instead say that uh, voting is indeed a, a right, it is, it is intrinsic to our freedom and must therefore be protected by the Constitution and the federal government. Yes. And the divided support of the 15th Amendment and the creation of the two women's suffrage organizations created major personal rifts within the movement. What impact do you feel the division had within the movement? And were you able to repair the damaged relationships caused?
by these controversies? Now, I suppose you've never met Lucy Stone, but I can tell you that she was a miserable woman and there were personal divisions between us far before this happened. Um, now, others will disagree with me. They will point to the fact that she was an expert public speaker and in many ways delightful. I'm sure, I'm sure that she could be, uh, that I did not find her as such. Uh, does not negate their opinion. However, there have always been personal differences in great movements, and we had our fair share. Now, did I have the ability to heal any of those? Well, my adversaries would say that, in fact, I made them far worse. Uh, when I wrote The History of Woman Suffrage, my daughter came home from England and looked at this, this, uh, pages, pages, hundreds of pages of writing, and uh, nothing, she noted, on the American Woman Suffrage Association. Uh, well, didn't seem important to me. Uh, she insisted that there be a chapter, and I insisted that she be the one to write it. But Lucy Stone wanted nothing to do with writing or participating in the history of women's suffrage. Uh, that was how deep our rift had become. and. Um, and truthfully, I, I do not think it was ever healed. I think that when we gathered together in what would become NASA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, it was only accomplished by rooting out those of us who were more radical. Um, that would be uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, for instance, uh, Lily Devereaux Blake, um, these women who were uh, often lower in income, um, more modest in income, more radical in sentiment, uh, found that they were no longer welcome in the new organization. And um, many of our political tactics were, were set aside in favor of tactics that I did not approve of. Now, I perhaps was too vain to allow myself to um, give up the presidency. Um, Matilda Jocelyn Gage was quite disappointed in that decision, and she started a new organization of radical women, and I entertained the idea of, of joining with her. Uh, the other issue for us was that they, they looked to the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, this was an organization that dwarfed all of the suffrage organizations in terms of population, mm -hmm. and uh, also, maybe more significantly, in terms of money. Yeah. Funding was always a problem for us, as I imagine it is for you today. It is still today, yes. And so we made decisions, uh, and the younger suffragists especially made decisions that were based on expedience rather than principle. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became an organization that I took issue with. And this was really where the rift between my dear Susan and I became visible. Oh. She believed in her nieces, as she called them, totally. I see. And um, I did not. And I felt that their emphasis was too much on suffrage and not enough on um, looking at the reasons for our inequality. If we all get the right to vote, and it is protected, but none of us truly challenge the initial justification for our inequality, then we will simply internalize that inequality and carry it with us to the ballot box. It is not enough to have political power. You also must have personal power, the same kind of power that I first witnessed in Lucretia Ma in 1840. Wow. That's how we changed the nation. Some of your contemporaries and future historians raised concerns over language used when discussing people of different races mm -hmm. and your affiliation with George Francis Train. How would you respond to these particular concerns? At the time, I said that I would have made a deal with the devil if it could get me the vote. And you remember too that I said that
that it was one of the darkest times in my personal history and in suffrage history. The Republican Party had turned on us. The Democrats were cynically offering the suggestion that if women had the right to vote, as well as Black men, that they could overwhelm Black voters with white female voters, particularly white Southerners. This was, interestingly, an idea that was also forwarded by Henry Blackwell, Lucy Stone's husband. It would come to be called the Southern strategy. It was a Machiavellian, cynical approach for all of us. It betrayed everything that we had fought for before, the ideals of universal suffrage, and beyond that, universal rights. My idea, and I often said this, was that I wanted nothing less than universal suffrage and that I did it also to protect the rights of Black women. But as my dear friend Frederick Douglass pointed out, the language I used was hurtful in the extreme. I gambled and lost. And as I lost, the entire movement was injured. And more so, I can again say from beyond the veil, the damage to the women I purported to care for was nearly um, irreversible. And if there was something I could regret in life, I would never admit it. But, and I will not tell you if Frederick and I made it to heaven or if we entered <laughs> the gates down below, but I can tell you from wherever I am that it was the wrong decision. Uh, um, other than the vote, what issues did you consider to be vital to the women's suffrage movement? You said that some people were just focused on voting, but you had other issues you really wanted to consider. When I was a little girl, mm -hmm. and I was told that the source of all of the inequality I was witnessing in my father's law office came from those law books, I decided to go in with a pair of scissors and cut all of the odious laws out of his books. I thought that will fix it. Now, as an old woman, I realized that the problem did not start in the law books. The problem started in the church. Because whenever any woman asked why it was that she was not considered as full a person as her brother was, she was referred to the Bible for an answer. So I, at this point, was tired of arguing with the men. So I took some Bibles and a pair of scissors and I cut all of those odious laws out and I pasted them in notebooks and together with a group of other women, we decided that we would try to see what the source of all of our pain was. Well, this was not a popular activity. It turned out that there were a number of women, suffragists, who took issue with this approach. Uh, the woman's Bible was the final straw and, and really um, closed the door on me as, as the uh, theoretical leader of the movement um, of the late 19th century. Uh, there were very few women willing to stand up for me, but I believed that I had very limited time left and I was going to use all of it to challenge this notion that we are inherently fundamentally different from our brothers. I did not believe that we were the sinful daughters of Eve, neither did I believe that we were angels sent from heaven to lift man out of his moral mud into a, into a clearer, finer future. We are human beings, citizens and persons. We must behave as such and we cannot accept any authority whether biblical or legal, that says otherwise. In the end, I followed Lucretia Mott's advice, truth for authority, not authority for truth. Wow. Well, that leads me to um, another question. 
is what are your thoughts on female candidates running for public office, particularly on the national level? And uh, you did run for Congress in 1866. And uh, especially in light of the current time when Biden and Harris are the ticket running for president and vice president right now. Could you talk about that? About having you want to, pretend uh, to be an expert in your time. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would be supportive of women running for office if their intentions are noble. I would, of course, be in favor of any policy that would bring more people into the clearer light of the future of freedom, of equality. I think that it is important forever in this nation and that our nation deserves nothing less for all of us to remember that just as I challenged the idea that the suffrage was the panacea for all our problems, suffrage is not your panacea either. When you are finished with your work voting, then you go on to the work of the rest of your life, agitating, advocating, writing, preaching, thinking, working always every day of your life as a citizen to make sure that whoever you put in office is accountable to the people. I do not know what these people you have mentioned will offer to the nation. I do know what each of you as individuals has before you. It doesn't matter who wins or loses, whatever election comes next, your work remains the same. And the Rosewater Brigade that wants to just celebrate the accomplishments of the past is never going to be good enough. This is the United States of America. We deserve nothing less as defenders of this principle of absolute unapologetic equality. Nothing less than each of our undying commitment to that most sacred of truths, that all men and women are created equal. Oh. Well, I was going to ask you one last question, but you've really answered it. I was going to ask you, and you might have further thoughts that I'd love to hear, but your daughters, particularly Harriet, continued your legacy of women's rights activism. What words of encouragement or advice do you have for the generations of women and men who continue in supporting women's rights activism? I will actually tell you that Harriet did exactly what I would want all of you to do. When she disagreed with me on the point of educated suffrage, something that I thought was important in, in, at the end of my life, as I thought many ignorant men have the vote, and here I am, Judge Katie's daughter, one of the greatest theorists of her age, still not able to vote. And Harriet was so horrified by my position in my leave taking of that principle of absolute equality that she wrote an article condemning my views in the rival suffrage paper. <laughs> and I was proud. That is what I ask of you. We are not angels, nor gods, nor even heroes. We are simply citizens doing the best we could in the times we had. If your future requires you to take us apart, to knock down our statues, to disavow us if you find that we no longer speak the truth. You must do it. Truth is always your most important ally in the fight for freedom. Nothing more, none of us is as good. What we did, we did for you. It's to you that we hand this this task, this goal, this sacred duty. And you must move forward, even if it means that you look backward at us 
and call us to account. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your words of wisdom. And it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with me. And it was just terrific. Thank you. Well, it was a pleasure to be here. I will also not tell you where I am, but um, it's wonderful to be here. And we're very fortunate to have you join in this conversation. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us and we now do have Mrs. Stanton with us. Hello, Mrs. Stanton. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Great. Well, we just had an excellent opportunity to watch the 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 interview that you and Mary uh, did last week, and and I'd now like to open it up to the audience for any questions that they may have for you. Um, while people are thinking about uh, some of their questions, uh, Mary had a, an interesting thought earlier today that she wanted to get your opinion on. Um, so just yesterday in Central Park in New York City, um, a new statue of you, including your friend Susan B. Anthony and also Sojourner Truth was unveiled. And those three statues are the first that commemorate real women in Central Park. And we were just interested to know what your relationship with uh, Mrs. Truth might have been or any other thoughts that maybe you may have had on her and how you feel about having that uh, statue of you in New York City. Well, it'd be quite close to where I was living when Sojourner Truth visited me, uh, 1866. Uh, it was the first convention after the Civil War. And I invited Sojourner Truth to my home to stay with my family during that convention. And that's probably the event that they're portraying, I would assume. Um, my daughter has very fond memories of that particular visit because it was her special job, little Hattie, uh, who became Harriet Stanton Blatch, to read the paper to Sojourner Truth. And Hattie had always taken great pride in her ability to, to read with great skill. Um, but it occurred to her while she was reading to Sojourner Truth that she was reading to a grown woman. And finally, she uh, screwed up her courage and said, um, why is it that I'm reading to you? Can't you read? And Sojourner Truth said, I don't read little things like letters. I read big things like men. And Hattie decided that reading had to be so much more than just deciphering signs on a page. She needed to exercise the same kind of analysis and wisdom that Sojourner Truth applied to the world. So if, if that's the event that they're portraying, then that's a very good event indeed. Excellent. Um, Anne asked if you would describe what a visit to, to Miss Anthony's home in Rochester would have been like for you. Oh, hard work. Um, no, I must say that most of the people who arrived at Susan B. Anthony's home were the little Stantons, because when they reached the magical age of seven, they would be hustled off to Susan's house, and um, they were then away from me, which was um, all for the good. Um, a house full of seven children is a, is a house too full of children. So Susan would take them. But when I visited Susan, uh, it meant that I was doing work. There was never a time when the two of us were together that she wanted us to relax. I think that Susan uh, was temperamentally um, unable to relax. And I often had to tell her that it was time for her to rest, that everybody has to rest. Uh, Susan did not seem to think this was um, a necessary force in life. Uh, so 
while I enjoyed spending time in that home, um, they were not, they were not holidays. <laughs> in fact, she was at my house on Christmas and we spent the entire Christmas day uh, getting petitions ready to send to Congress. <laughs> That's, that sounds like a very uh, interesting holiday to have. Um, Amy asked, uh, Mrs. Stanton, we've heard so much about your relationship with your father. What was your relationship like with your mother? Was she liberated as you and her role as mother in the family? Margaret Livingston Katie was a formidable woman. She was the daughter of a Revolutionary War hero, and she had rather a military mentality when it came to raising children. I can remember standing almost at attention when Margaret Cady was in the room. She stood nearly six feet tall and was an expert horsewoman, a woman of a great ability. She also was very defiant of my father who said that he wanted to live in the country and my mother said, no, we will not. We will live in town. He said that only a fool would have a rocking chair and sit back and rock back and forth. So my mother insisted there would always be a rocking chair in our home. Uh, so she was defiant. But I think that my sisters and my father, while he lived, um, spun a web of convention around her. And when my father died in 1859, my mother became much more liberated, as you say, than she had been in my childhood. My daughters remember a much more jolly woman than I recall, which is probably true for many children and grandchildren. But um, I can recall that the, most of the house was off limits to us, especially the attic. And uh, at one point, my sister Madge and I crept up into the attic and I can remember Madge standing there and saying, by the holy pokers, can you imagine what mother would say if she found us up here? And just then my mother's arm snaked up from underneath from the floor and grabbed her by the ankle and we heard this voice, by the holy pokers, here I am. <laughs> so mother was, mother was, a strong woman. And my daughter Harriet would tell you she was also merry and kind and liberated and, and a, a Garrisonian abolitionist through and through. Thank you. Um, Amy was curious, after you got married, um, did you have servants in your household and were they African Americans? They were not, um, they were not black servants. They were often Irish servants. This was uh, difficult at times because these were young women who knew very little about housekeeping and I had to train them. I started off my house in Chelsea. I had two servants. Now I grew up with 12 servants in my family home in Johnstown. So I had to make do with considerably fewer people to assist me than mother had. Um, I eventually had a wonderful housekeeper who stayed with us for the entire time my children were growing up. And that was Amelia Willard. And she was, she was a great blessing to the family, a Quaker woman and, an, and a suffragist. But most of my other um, helpers were uh, considerably less skilled, especially the woman I chose because she had been recommended to me by a phrenologist. She had just the right bumps on her head to indicate that she would be a good servant. But she drank too heavily and she scorched the baby's little leg against the stove. And my husband suggested that in future, instead of checking with phrenologists, I should check for references. So Anne asked a question that might need a little bit of uh, context for you. So the, the current president of the United States is Donald Trump. And recently to celebrate the, uh, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which was passed after your, your passing, um, which granted women the right to vote. Um, he has recently pardoned Susan B. Anthony for, uh, for her, her guilty verdict in her trial. 
And Anne would like to know, what do you think Miss Anthony would think about being pardoned in our time? Susan B. Anthony never wanted to apologize for her suffrage activity. She certainly did not need a pardon. So I think that uh, dear Susan, if I may speak for her, would say that that was contrary to the entire purpose of her action, which was to challenge the government rather than to seek its approval. With, with her trial, how disappointed do you think she was that she didn't have the opportunity to take her court case to a higher level than it went to? Well, that, of course, was the, the primary goal. And she was deeply disappointed. I can tell you she was also disappointed in me. And I can recall a series of letters in which she expressed some dismay that I was so lukewarm in my regard for her action. Now, Matilda Jocelyn Gage had accompanied her um, all through Ontario and Monroe counties in preparation for this, this case. I had not. But I was at that point already quite tired of the suffrage battle and was really becoming more interested, more engaged in other issues. And, and this was really at the beginning of the tension uh, in, in Susan's and my understanding of our ultimate goals in the, in the movement. I, of course, was still adamant in my desire for the suffrage. The elective franchise is a fundamental right but I increasingly felt that there was um, limited efficacy in putting our focus on the ballot without looking into the context of um, our oppression. So she was a little disappointed that I was not more angry and hurt on her behalf. I got I have to unmute myself there. Uh, there, there were a few times that you, that you and Miss Anthony may have disagreed with each other, as you, as you talked about in in your interview as well. Uh, Amy also asked in your courtship with your uh, to be husband. So when you and Henry were uh, courting, did he share any of your beliefs about the role of uh, women in society and suffrage? He did, in fact. And in, in many ways, he was in advance of my position at that time in our relationship. I outpaced him very quickly. But at that point, he was a, a firm advocate of women's rights within the abolitionist movement. In fact, he was the person who trained the Grimke sisters in public speaking and was one of the only male abolitionists who would um, welcome the Grimke sisters to share a stage with him. So uh, when we were married, uh, Henry was already very familiar with the concept of removing the word obey from the, from the marriage ceremony. His dearest friend, Theodore Weld, had, had married Angelina Grimke, and Theodore Weld and Angelina had removed that word from their ceremony. So uh, Henry was already well-versed in the concept of women's rights. He was a person who held different strategic ideas from me. We both believed that there must be universal human rights, but we often differed in how one achieves that end. So we have a question about um, some of your descendants. So you, you may not uh, be able to answer this directly based on how much you can see of our current time. Um, but Anne was wondering if any of your descendants are active leaders in women's rights in 2020, or if you know of any uh, of your descendants, their work within women's rights um, towards the end of, end of your life as well. Well, I can tell you that I did know about the statue, and that is okay. because my great-great-granddaughter, Colleen Jenkins, is a figure who looms large in this 
in your century and has been behind that, um, that project. And I do keep tabs on my great great granddaughter. During my own lifetime, my own daughter and my granddaughter, Nora, were beginning, who was beginning to become involved in the women's rights movement. Hattie, Harriet Stanton Blatch, was extremely involved and um, she was um, passionate about the cause. My, my son, Theodore, was also an advocate of women's rights and he wrote a book um, in France about European women's rights and the suffrage movement in Europe. Excellent. Do we have any other questions for Mrs. Stanton? When else do you get to ask a question to uh, one of the founders of the women's rights movement? If you would like to type it in the chat box, or even if, at this point, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask uh, Mrs. Stanton a question, this is your opportunity to do so. Okay, so that looks like it may be the last question that came through for Mrs. Stanton today. Oh, oh, hold on, I just got one. Uh, were you actively engaged with Matilda Jocelyn Gage? So maybe you can uh, discuss your relationship with uh, Miss Gage a little bit as well. In our time, we were called the triumvirate, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Susan B. Anthony, and myself. Matilda Jocelyn Gage was a brilliant theoretician. She was one of our most important historians, always giving us the information that we needed to confront any, any of the lords of creation who contested that women had never accomplished anything in the past. Matilda Jocelyn Gage would be the first to say that that was not the case. She was also the author of Woman, Church, and State. She and I were both very interested in the idea of a pre-patriarchal culture, a matriarch, it is what we called it. And in fact, she is the one who most, uh, is most responsible for, for creating my own interest in, in that idea. So she was a partner, a colleague, a uh, most influential thinker. Uh, and it was my pleasure to work with her on the Woman's Bible, as well as on the history of woman suffrage. Both of these uh, were projects that she was uh, one of the primary authors. Thank you. Any other questions for Mrs. Stanton at this time? Well, Mrs. Stanton, thank you so much for being with us. At this time, since there are no more questions for Mrs. Stanton, if there are any questions uh, for Dr. Gruby, uh, we can take those at this time. Or if anybody has any questions uh, for Mary Berry from the League of Women Voters, um, we would be happy to take anything. Uh, any questions about their role in today's pr uh, program? Or if Mary, if you would like to say any comments while... Uh... Well, I would just uh, um, say that it's just been a, a real pleasure in being part of this program. It was great. Yesterday was uh, um, the culmination of all the efforts of the uh, various uh, different activities to celebrate the 19th Amendment. But one thing I would like to leave everyone with is to remember that yesterday was the 100th anniversary of that constitutional amendment. And it was passed by one vote of Representative Harry Byrne from Tennessee. And without his vote, I'm not sure when it would have occurred. So I'm encouraging all of you to go out and vote. Don't forget to vote. That every vote is important. And we have, uh, um, the League of Women Voter, Voters has a lot of information on our website. 
And I can take questions about uh, voting if you have them. But if you don't, that's, um, you can go to the websites to find out. Thank you, Mary. Melinda, we do have a question for you. Um, Rashi was curious where you're recording from and if you set up this background every time that you do a reenactment. Um, this is this is my living room. <laughs> <laughs> is, oh. this how, is this how you set it up every every time you do one of these virtual uh, reenactments? Uh, well, I um, I just move my parlor table out of my ah! parlor <laughs> and, and that's it. <laughs> And I, uh, and I would just like to say thank you for a very delightful, engaging, and insightful presentation. Kudos. I would just like to say thank you so much. And I'm sure the rest of us, it was truly uh, a pleasurable experience and a very good learning experience. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you, Margaret. I agree. It was a great presentation. Uh, and just in, we will have the recording available. I know Melinda, you'll you'll never want to watch it, uh, but we will have the recording available so that it can be uh, watched again. Um, I would like to thank Melinda again uh, for uh, being a part of this program. Mary, thank you so much. Your part was integral to this program. Um, I. I uh, want to thank you and everybody at the League of Women Voters who made this happen, and I will give everybody a round of applause, and thank you everybody who was able to join us today. <laughs>